Thank you. All right, well, it's great to be back. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, this is uh, intended to be just like a quick reference of, of the basic interlaminar approach that hopefully um, in the future, uh, if you're doing your first interlaminar case, you can come back and, and reference. Um, so obviously I want to shout out the Endoscopic Spine Research Study Group, um, ISERF. And so the interlaminar approach is a very versatile approach. You guys are all extremely familiar with this approach already, right? You do all these cases, all these pathologies already. It's the same thing. You're going dorsal interlaminar. The only difference is you, you're using an endoscope. And so that, that's, uh, that has its technical challenges. Um, but you can tackle essentially anything you want with this. Um, the interlaminar window, this uh, graphic was shown earlier gets much wider the further down the spine you go. So um, there's less bone to remove the further da uh, uh, caudal you move in the spinal canal. So that's biggest at L5-S1. And so in my opinion, if your ideal first case, if you're, if you're here at this course or you're watching this video because you're thinking about your first interlaminar case, I would recommend doing an L5-S1 paracentral non-migrated herniated soft disc uh, in otherwise normal anatomy. This is from Christoph's uh, textbook. Um, the key anatomic landmark when you're targeting um, for, your, for your cannula placement is the laminar IAP junction of the rostral vertebral uh, level. And so that's, you know, that's essentially the same thing you're doing for a tubular case, right? The only difference is that there is a, a bit of a, a critical C-arm maneuver. Um, and so what, I, what we mean by that is that, you know, if you tilt the C-arm, you'll start to open up the inner laminar window over the disc space. And that's what you're trying to do, because what you're trying to do is open up the window so that you are directly looking at the disc and there's less lamina for you to actually um, drill through. And so when you have the window maximally open at this, um, the, then you should see the, the bisection of the, of the interspinous processes. So this is what, you, what you're looking at. And typically that means you're caudally tilting the C-arm about 15 degrees. So here's a targeting example. This is a large left paracentral um, herniated disc. So you can see that I've already um, caudally tilted uh, the window quite a bit with the C-arm. And so there's the disc, and then of course there's the interlaminar window, and I've positioned that directly uh, in the middle of the disc, right? And then my uh, marking um, trocar, I'm, I'm putting my skin incision exactly at the tip of that trocar, which is right at the laminar IAP junction. So once you go down, you, you come down with your trocar and your sequential dilators, and this part is important to actually take some time and scrape uh, the muscle off of the bone, just like you would if you're doing a tubular case, right? You, you put down your tubes and then you're scraping um, so that you have more of the muscle out of the way so that when you put your tube down, you're not staring at a bunch of muscle. Same concept applies in interlaminar endoscopic. Once you do that, then you can dock your probe and then this is, uh, this is what it should look like. Um, and so generally, if you can start a little bit more medial, then with the endoscope, these scopes uh, all have about 15 degree angulation, so you can actually look lateral and undercut the facet and decrease the amount of bone resection you have to do and minimize disruption to the, to the facet joint. In many cases, you don't have to remove any of the facet joint at all at L5-S1. So again, when you do something like that, then you, you see that you can start medial and access the disc herniation and undercut and decompress without really taking any of the facet joint. So here's a little case example. Um, L5-S1 paracentral disc herniation. The patient has a left S1 radiculopathy. This disc is a little bit more lateral. You can see that it's uh, in the proximal foramen as well. So here's the targeting. Again, I'm starting a little bit medial, looking a little bit lateral, so I can um, leverage the, the 15 degree angle on the scope to, to undercut lateral uh, and minimize the amount of bone resection. And so these are the progression pearls. So um, in this, uh, again, we, this is left side, so cranials to the left, caudals to the right, lateral is um, at six o'clock. And so you know the first thing that happens uh, is that you have to deal with the soft tissue. And this is always what happens when you first put in the scope. You just see this. So you'll be tempted to bring in your RF probe and try to shrink the tissues down. But if you do that, you're going to spend 20 minutes and accomplish nothing. So what you really have to do is during the, uh, the, the dilator placement, the cannula placement, you have to have sort of this stereotactic idea of where the bone is in your, in your mind. And you just have to bring a soft tissue resector like a scissor punch um, or graspers and just remove as much tissue as quickly as you can while you're palpating and feeling for that laminar edge. And once you get to the laminar edge, then you can continue to expand your inner laminar window. And so once you expand your inner laminar window and, and identify that 
uh, rostral vertebral uh, lamina drop off, then you can find your ligamentum flavum, expose that, drill uh, as necessary. Um, oftentimes you don't have to drill. In this case, I decided to drill, especially because part of that disc herniation was lateral into the proximal foramen. So this step is, you know, the same as what uh, Pat Kim just described, you know, following the ligamentum flavum. And you already do this in, in your standard cases, uh, tubular cases, open uh, microdiscs too. You're following the ligamentum flavum all the way up and you're uh, using a curette to release um, that junction, and then you come and do the same thing all the way down and all the way lateral to release all the ligamentum flavum. Once I've released the ligamentum flavum, I typically actually open the, uh, the, uh, the ligamentum flavum medially, because if you have a loose ligamentum flavum and you, and you open it laterally, it's hard to resect ligamentum flavum moving from lateral to medial and it's much easier to go from medial to lateral. So then I open up a, a hole um, with these uh, scissor punches medially and re resect the ligamentum flavum. And then you oftentimes uh, have to deal with a lot of epidural fat, and epidural fat is often covering the traversing nerve root, so you, you can carefully remove that. And then once you identify the root, you can see that the root is, is uh, bowed up, it's under tension because of the disc herniation underneath it, and you can see that it's not very mobile. And this is a key step, um, you know, we, we like to mobilize this root so that we can put our cannula in and rotate it out of the way, and you'll see these epidural ligaments uh, right on the right-hand side of that root. And so if you don't release these ligaments, it's very hard to mobilize that root. And so um, you, sh you can get a blunt dissector, ball tip probe to release those um, uh, ligaments. And so once you release those epidural ligaments, then you will be able to come in with the cannula rotation maneuver that you guys have all seen over and over again. So then you can leave your dissector there and start to manipulate your cannula. And, you know, sometimes it's better to rotate counterclockwise, sometimes it's better to rotate clockwise. That doesn't matter. It's just whichever way the root wants to move. So once you've got the root decompressed, then you have what's called the Derman shadow. So Peter described. <laughs> so once you, once you see a shadow underneath the, the nerve root and it's pulsating, that's when you know you're done, right? So Derman shadow, shout out to Peter. And so when you look at the, these patients, and this is, this, this is literally every single patient that you do this for, you'll notice that they never really get any surgical back pain. So the, there's essentially no surgical back pain. And then if you look at their uh, opioid intake, these people do not need opioids at all. So, you know, there's still, a, I think there's still a subpopulation of tubular patients that, that have a lot of pain, right? And so you can avoid that with, uh, with this type of approach. And so again, the key progression, target the laminar facet junction with an open inner laminar window that requires a little bit of caudal tilting. Uh, soft tissue dissection with um, uh, uh, blunt dilators uh, so that there's less uh, muscle when you first bring your uh, scope in. Um, find that lamina efficiently, right? Bone is your first anatomic landmark that you need to get to, and you want to get to that as fast, uh, uh, as quickly as you can, efficiently as you can. Open the flavor medially so that it's easier to resect laterally, and then mobilize the root and take the epidural ligaments around so that you can actually uh, manipulate and rotate the, uh, the nerve root out of the way. So that's it, and um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, um, really enjoyed um, your talk here. You know, one question for you. When Are you, you done with your corpectomy already? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, so when you mobilize the traversing nerve root, there's always these bridging vessels. You know, they're either it's ligament or bridging vessels. Yeah. Do you coagulate them first, or do you just maybe you know medialize and then deal with the bleeding? It's just like I've seen people do it either or. So I'm curious what people do. I so if it's a ligament, then whatever, right? But but to your point, if it's a vessel and it's very obvious, very obvious to to see it, um, then I will cauterize it and then cut it with a scissor punch before I I mobilize. Yeah. You know. And just like an open surgery, you wouldn't just tear through a vein and then just have yeah. bleeding everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's it depends on the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, one of the things that you said, uh, you did, which I think is really important, is that when you were at the apex of the disc, I saw you had some pressure on the disc, and then you took your, uh, I guess it was a you know, sharp pen field, yeah. and you just pushed it in, and then you created the defect. Yeah. I think that's so important, and you didn't really talk as much about that, but I think that cuts down on disc free hernia. Because I think if you do open surgery, 
you make a big square annulotomy. I mean, some people do that. You make a square annulotomy, and we all know from the studies that the bigger the annulotomy, the higher risk of recurrence. So you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know? that's that's a great point, and uh, and you're right. I should have uh, elaborated on that more. I mean, I think. Um, you know, when you're doing an open microdiscectomy, the first thing you ask for when you see the disc is the knife, right? And and you're going to make a big cruciate cut or, or box, uh, as you mentioned. But in um, for interlaminar endoscopic discectomy, all you have to do is take a semi, you know, blunt uh, pointed uh, dissector, and just you can pop right in without any problems. You can even get in there with a small um, a biting pituitary rongeur, and so your annulotomy is much smaller. To your point, um, for decreasing reherniation rates and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, and also, if you make the annulotomy smaller, when you drop the cannula and you rotate the root out of the way, then you can press down onto the disc, and that pressure will help deliver uh, the herniation of the fragment into your cannula, uh, since you've contained that disc uh, under pressure. I guess we'll have to use it. I just like pimple popping, right? It's what it is yeah. at times. <laughs> yeah. How often do you go in and, and drill down the marginal osteophytes? You know, you know, like in older patients, um, you know, would be interesting how often people do that. So I do that every single case if if it looks like the the dermin shadow is not complete enough, oh. um, then I do, and the root looks like it's still under tension. I absolutely do it, and I think the biggest advantage of uniportal versus biportal, and I do biportal surgery. Um, the, I think the biggest advantage of uniportal is that. I, when I've got that cannula in there and the root protected out of the way, I don't, I'm not afraid to bring in a drill and burr down those osteophytes. Yeah. What do the other people do with the osteophytes? Who drills down these osteophytes? I drill the osteophytes. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can do, safely do it, right? So that's Sometimes cool you thing. can just cut it with the scissors as well. Uh, the the micropunch kind of punching yeah. it down. Yeah. Osteotone. Yeah. <laughs> Osteotone. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think we're going to move on.